Good afternoon and welcome to this month's show. I'm Jim Fleisick. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government industry leaders in securing cyberspace. With me today on the show are S.C. Miller, the Chief Information Security Officer, Department of Defense, Peter Kim, the Chief Information Security Officer, U.S. Air Force, Dominic Cassatt, the Chief Information Security Officer, Department of Veterans Affairs, Tony Cole, Chief Technology Officer, Global Government at FireEye, Tony Hubbard, Principal Cyber Lead at KPMG, and Clark Campbell, the VP for the Public Sector at BDNA. Let's talk some cybersecurity. Certainly a hot topic. I think you can't pick up a newspaper uh, any day in trade journal, not read something about a cyber attack or, or a cybersecurity issue or whatever. So let's talk about progress that we see being made. Let's start with uh, Essie Miller at DOD. Essie, tell us about some of the progress you see being made as you try to uh, work through some of these uh, cybersecurity matters. It's been a great time for DOD. For the last 18, 24 months, we've been focused on visibility, mm -hmm. you know, understanding what's on the network, who's connected to the network, and what they're doing on the network. Right. You know, we implemented the cybersecurity scorecard, which has propelled us leaps and bounds to understand what our environment looks like. Obviously, we can't defend what we right. can't see. Absolutely. So awareness is very key. The other thing we're focused on is cloud adoption. Mm -hmm. you know, Do you think cloud is... Uh some argue cloud creates security issues. Others argue, argue cloud's an opportunity because you have an opportunity to really know what you have, like you were just saying. I think it's a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it needs to be more of a hybrid. Right. You know, it, based on the information. Absolutely. We need to understand the information before we make a decision where to put it. Makes sense. And then deal with it from a security aspect Absolutely. in that same well day. Said. Well said. Uh, Peter Kim, how about progress over at the Air Force? What do you so, see? Uh, um, so whatever DOD is doing, we're there right, uh, answer, right with it. Great answer. <laughs> great answer. <laughs> um, but a little different spin to that one. So we have a new Secretary of Defense, uh -huh. uh, Secretary of the Air, Air Force. Force, and also Defense. But uh, Secretary uh, Wilson, uh, the very first thing that she looked at, one of the first pieces of paper that she looked at was the scorecard, mm -hmm. the Air Force metrics on cybersecurity. Uh, and she's made it a point to make it a priority at her level and with all the four stars in the Air Force. So we've actually uh, ramped up some progress in that area. We'd had, we had reached some stasis some kind of uh, in the last three months, not made the progress I thought we liked, but she showed up right. and all of a sudden it's just new energy. Oh, so good. it is true, the CEO cares, uh, everybody else cares and on down the, uh, the entire Air Force. So that's been a, a great thing to help propel cybersecurity here. Yeah, that's really good to hear because that has been a problem in the past where people, uh, you know, at the mid-level mid managers and all would be really concerned about the issue, but the top of the echelon maybe Absolutely. wasn't top of their agenda, but sure. now it is, She's now it is. Doing the metrics once a month with the chief of staff, the Air Force, and all the four stars. Yeah, and well, certainly meeting. all the things that have gone on in the country and all the, 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 the break-ins and the data breaches and all, I think, have brought it up to a, a high priority. Tony uh, Hubbard over at KPMG, tell us how KPMG plays in this and progress you see being made in, in your customer base across government. I think one of the key themes we're seeing from a progress perspective is more discussion around risk management. I think it wasn't that long ago there was a perception that you could protect yourself entirely, you could have 100% security, and I think now the discussion is moving towards how do we manage risk. Mm -hmm. You know, we understand that at some point uh, our, our clients or the government may be compromised, so how do we respond to that? How do we manage the risk around that? How do we make sure that our crown jewels are protected? I think there's more discussion around that than there was before, and I think that's a very positive trend. You know, that's a great point, because I, uh, in discussion with higher levels, when, you know, when chief information security officers talk about cyber security and bits and bytes and things like that, it's it's not necessarily, it doesn't resonate that well, but if you talk about risk management and the risk to the organization, if we don't do this, I think it, it's a much more powerful message. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Dominic Cassatt at uh, VA. Uh, VA's been pretty much uh, well represented in, uh, in the, the trade journals and a lot of things going on there, a lot of big programs going on there. Tell us uh, the progress you're making in securing these programs. Yeah, yeah, there's been a lot of um, chatter lately about uh, the department, about our veterans. Uh, that's certainly a focus now. Yeah, most All Americans want to take care of our, our veterans. So it's been a pretty exciting couple of years for VA. 
Uh, some people don't realize how big the VA is. I mean, it's a real scope and scale right. um, um, discussion. Uh, we are a $190 billion a year agency. We're the size of a Fortune 10 company. Right. We service 22 million veterans a year. Uh, so uh, it, it's a very big enterprise. Um, so, uh, you know, we really, you know, Took, took a fresh look at the VA and at cybersecurity back in 2015, and we established a, a, a huge uh, integrated master schedule to address uh, some of the shortcomings we saw in VA cybersecurity. And again, the scale, uh, you know, right. really makes it a massive effort. But we've had a lot of success. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example okay. uh, with the recent uh, WannaCry ransomware. Right. Ransomware is right. a, a big issue for us with sure. healthcare because it can cost lives if uh, yeah, an adversary. Gets Absolutely. in. I've been reading things, and you not only have the traditional IT stuff, we got all the medical devices exactly. and all the Internet of Things kind of stuff. Exactly. So the healthcare industry is a real target for mm -hmm. for things like ransomware. So when WannaCry happened, uh, of course we um, rallied, we scrambled the jets, we we pulled the staff together, and and when we stopped in and looked uh, at our patching status um, against uh, the WannaCry vulnerability, we were at uh, over 98 percent across our huge enterprise, uh, which is. A global enterprise, yeah. 350,000 users on our networks. Um, so that's really a testament to the hard work Absolutely. that's happened uh, at VA in terms of Absolutely. cybersecurity. Congratulations on that. That's good news. Uh, Clark Campbell of BDNA, tell us uh, how your progress you see being made in supporting your customer base across government and so I've spoken to no Russians today. Okay, well that's a good thing. Just covering that off. Two, what Dominic just mentioned is what BDNA does, because we actually support the entire enterprise of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Oh wow, cool. Where we provide that proactive information from a cybersecurity standpoint of what is the end of life, what is the end of support, what is the current vulnerabilities that you have, regardless of the data sources, whether they be the Taniums of the world, the big fixes, the ADDMs, the SCCMs of the world. You need to aggregate it, dedupe it, understand it, turn it into actual intelligence to be able to be proactive in cybersecurity as opposed to reactive. Too often cybersecurity is, oh wow, we've had a vulnerability, we've had an issue, there's a problem. Uh, you should know that ahead of time. So that's what BDNA does. And thank you, Dominic, for the advertisement ahead of time. Very good, very good. Uh, Tony Cole, um, FireEyes uh, become a household name too in the cybersecurity world over the last several years. Tell us a little bit about progress you see being made in, in supporting your customer base. Well, I think the uh, federal government across the board has actually come a very long way in a uh, in a relatively short period of time when you think about how long the enterprise has actually existed. You know, I think many of the, uh, the, the counterparts here at the table and, and their colleagues across, you know, other government agencies have really started to understand that uh, we can't stop all the breaches. We can actually work on the risk so and mitigate, you know, the impact of these right. breaches. And then we're starting to see great progress from that across the board. I think there's a lot more folks today that are starting to look at this infusing intelligence from industry into their solutions and their programs they have, as well as actually focusing on, you know, not just FATARA and FISMA, but actual risk mitigation to take them to a better score on FATARA and FISMA across right. the board. Right. I agree with you. And I think that uh, makes a, a whole lot of sense. Let's talk a little bit about um, some of the priorities for the upcoming year and things that uh, we think are need to be addressed. Uh, like you said, Tony, um, you know, we like to believe we can get out in front and, and, and prevent as many things as possible, but it's impossible to prevent 100%. So I think resiliency is a big issue, uh, to be prepared of what are you going to do in the event you need to recover and things like that. But uh, rather than me talk, let's talk to, let's hear about priorities from your perspective. Let's start with Dominic uh, Kassat at, at, at uh, VA. What are your big priorities? What's the hot buttons for you this coming year? So uh, when I arrived at VA about a year and a half ago, um, it, it struck me how many good things were going on at VA in terms of cybersecurity and the great staff that they have. But um, there was really nothing there that tied it all together in, so that in everyone's mind they understood what the holistic right. program was. So uh, there was a new executive orders, order signed out by the president uh, a few months ago right. uh, called Strengthening Cybersecurity of Federal Networks and Critical Infrastructure. So we're seeing this uh, executive order as an opportunity uh, to array all the great things that we're doing around this cybersecurity framework, which uh, has the five tenets of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover, because it helps us convey 
convey to our enterprise why we're doing what we're doing and right. how it all fits together. And, and then we can have more of a measured plan to get there. Right. Uh, and then also really train and retain a, an exceptional staff around those five elements. So Excellent. over the next year, we're, you're, the, we're gonna see a lot of big changes at VA to really put us in lockstep with that framework. Cool. So you have like a game, a game plan and a exactly. roadmap to get there. Exactly. Excellent, Peter Kim, how about uh, Air Force? What are, what are your hot buttons? What's in the front burner for uh, you the upcoming year? A couple things. Uh, the Air Force stood up the Cyber Resiliency Office for Weapon Systems uh, last year. Uh, that's a tackling the, uh, the cybersecurity of our uh, Biz, uh, mission systems and weapon systems, a lot of that stuff has information technology and so uh, we're figuring out through some mission threat analysis with the Crow's office led by uh, Dennis Miller at the Air Force Material Command on where those hot buttons, critical assets are that we need to secure. And so that's a big effort that sure. we continue to do for our, some of our most precious weapon systems. The second thing is, um, is keep continuing to roll out this capability that we call the automated remediation asset detection tool. Basically, it's an endpoint security uh, solution uh, that we've procured for our unclassified networks, and we're extending that into our the other things that we really care about, financial systems, logistics, personnel, medical, weapon systems. So it's the same kind of a solution being used in multiple yes. things. So to Build what, once, use many. What S.C. Miller <laughs> talked about, having a situational awareness of the cyberspace that, that we're responsible for, extending it beyond our core network and into the other areas that, uh, that actually move and move the Air Force missions. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Uh, S.C. Miller, how about uh, from your perspective, okay. priorities for the year? Let me build on what Pete just okay. talked about. You know, the, re the remediation efforts that the Air Force is doing, it resonates across all of the, the military services. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we get to automated patch management so we move away from being reactive, right. um, but making decisions based on the threats that we see beforehand, mm -hmm. uh, such that we harden the surface. I'm less concerned about what's within the network and more focused on what's coming my way and hardening to protect against yeah. that. You know, one of the big drivers there is moving to Windows 10 across the department. Yeah, I know, you know? it's a big effort uh, of your prior CIO was made to be Exactly. Effort. And even with the administration change and the new Deputy Secretary of Defense, the mandate to move by March 2018 is still a still major there. priority. It, it is. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen, similar to what Pete alluded to earlier, all of the service secretaries and unders coming to the table to say, hey, we're going to reallocate and adjust resources to fund this and make it happen. Wow. I mean, that's what you need. You know, you get the management behind it and um, it, it, uh, it moves forward. It, it helps immensely. Uh, Tony Cole, you know, what are some of the priorities you see in cybersecurity for the upcoming year? Well, I think, you know, uh, many folks today understand, as you mentioned earlier, Jim, you know, we're seeing just a slew of attacks continuously increase in sophistication. So I think one of the priorities that the federal government is focusing on that we really like is starting to actually make sure that they're looking at data sets from endpoints and from their network perimeter as well and tying all this together and fusing it with intelligence. So that's giving them a better picture, as SA said, you know, of what's coming across the board, what their priorities are and what they need to focus on, and then actually building courses of action so to actually automate. I think the other piece is we're going to see more and more uh, speed applied towards moving to the cloud because quite literally, I know all of these folks, everyone has trouble finding enough security professionals and that is uh, at least one benefit that you get moving to the cloud. These companies that focus on cybersecurity in the cloud, that gives you a great benefit and the government is starting to build some really good requirements for cloud providers to meet their requirements in the federal space. Yeah, well, there's FedRAMP out there and things like that and, um, and I do think cloud is an opportunity. Um, I actually taught cybersecurity for 18 years at a graduate level on Saturdays and the um, uh, you know, I used to try to start off with the complexity of the thing, but talk about, you know, you need the endpoints, you know, and we have CDM programs and things like that. You need to protect data in motion, data at rest. Uh, and, and, and there's also the devices in the network, and that's where I think places like, you think about VA, the amount of devices you have that are not traditional IT devices necessarily, but all the medical equipment and things like that that have to be dealt with. Um, let's get back to uh, talk, talk about priorities with, uh, with the other panelists here. Tony Hubbard, um, what are some of the priorities priorities you see for the upcoming year in, in cybersecurity? Well, I think from a priority perspective, I think it needs to continue to be the theme of focusing on the fundamentals, the you know, blocking and tackling, and having good, uh, obviously technology is fantastic, and there's a lot of technologies we're talking about that can be very helpful and beneficial, but if you look at some of the major breaches recently, 
they came down to the fundamentals. Not and, and some of them were very simple. I mean, uh, you know, someone clicks on a link. But I mean, and that's there, there's there's not many technologies that are going to prevent somebody from coming in in the morning who haven't had their cup of coffee yet and they're not quite awake and they see an email come in with a link and they click on it. Next thing you know, you have malware in your yeah. environment. Yeah. And you might not even know it. And though. they might I mean, not even the, know the, it. The link right. may do something that looks like it did what it was supposed to do, but in the meantime, it drops some malware into your system. Exactly. And that, and then you know, the WannaCry was just an outdated patch. You you had target breaches, OPM breaches. These are low-hanging fruit items just around fundamentals of maintaining good cyber hygiene, and I think that has to be continue to be a priority going forward. I think it's a good point. Let me chime in. I think that's a good point because one of the things we continue to focus on is a culture shift. Yeah. You know, we talk about security, and we focus on the security officer. Right. And it's helping the general population understand that we all have a role Absolutely. In Every single individual in your organization has some responsibility for cybersecurity. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tony, you have comment? Yeah, I, I like what Essie said on trying to actually change the culture, and I think gamification is something that's starting to actually really take hold in the industry, making the users sensors in the environment. Good so point. I think. I think if the federal government can actually get on board with that and start to drive it, and it's harder because they can't incentivize people like commercial companies right. can, but it could create a uh, very, very large success because the cyber hygiene piece we've been talking about for 20 years, yeah. right. and it's still not institutionalized. Right. So we, we need to get there sooner. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we still have people that, you know, we're still doing patches and patches and patches and patches and patches, which I call the Band-Aid approach as opposed to stepping back and looking at, you know, the big picture here. Uh, Clark Campbell, let's, uh, from your perspective, uh, what do you see as priorities in cyberspace uh, for the upcoming year? It's a common operational picture that needs to be established just as the DOD, since their DOD is well represented here, that they, when they go into battle, it's the same thing from a cyber standpoint. What, who is the enemy? Where are they? Where are they coming from? If you can have that information in a proactive way versus a reactive way, it would improve just the overall efficiency and the challenges they have. There is a, a budget challenge that will not solve all right. the problems at any one time in any one year of appropriations. But if you can prioritize with visibility, with a common operational picture through a single pane of glass, that would help. Mm -hmm. I think you hit on something that, that to me is, is critical. We, we, we need to get to be a proactive society when it comes to these issues. I think, you know, for many, many years we've been reactive. You know, something bad happens, we patch it. We band-aid it. We fix it. Um, we need to get out in front of those things and, and treat these things in a more proactive uh, mood uh, area. Um, we want to talk about lessons learned and challenges and where we're going in the future and things like that. But uh, before we do that, we're going to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with S.E. Miller from Department of Defense, Peter Kim from the Air Force, Dominic Cusset from Veterans Affairs, Tony Cole from FireEye, Tony Hubbard from KPMG, and Clark Campbell from BDNA. We're talking cybersecurity. We've been talking a little bit about progress. We're talking about some of the priorities for the upcoming year. Uh, now let's talk about some lessons learned. What we've learned, what we've learned, on the program is that um, oftentimes our listeners, who are your colleagues, like to uh, hear some of the things that you guys have experienced, which help them in, in, what, in perhaps overcoming similar kinds of uh, uh, things. So let's talk lessons learned. Let's start with Peter Kim. P Peter, what, what are you learning, uh, kind of, as you go through the process? Uh, so a little bit about what we were talking about before. It's a big, it's a big culture people problem challenge for me. Uh, so we're we're launching in a couple uh, initiatives starting this month. Um, th so we we see the issue and the challenge with two two camps. There's the cyber operations cybersecurity camp, uh, and for the most part, I think they're aware of all the threats. Uh, the big challenge there is the culture shift to learn new things and to move to new technologies and capabilities. So um, they've got their head down day to day using the tool sets they have and the processes and the concept of operations on how to do the network. Um, my challenge is to introduce new technologies and new ways of doing business and thinking about the problem and start kind of weaving that to the fabric of their day-to-day -day operations. And so that's that's a big challenge as we kind of look to jettison the old technologies and bring in new things like artificial intelligence, automated endpoint security. How do we how do we 
weave that in so that we're, I'm not overwhelming them with uh, a bunch of new stuff. The other thing we're launching is for the non-cyber operators is a big culture campaign in the Air Force. So uh, the CISO's office and myself are about to go out to the, all corners of the earth to, for the cyber secure, cybersecurity culture campaign to educate uh, our airmen. Um, civilians, contractors, whoever we can reach, act of duty on the cyber threat, what it means to them, and what they can do to assure mission. So yeah, excellent, well said. The uh, and thanks for bringing up culture. We're now 154 for 154. When we talk uh, challenges and issues and whatever, uh, we have not done a radio show that culture and people have not been put on the table as as an issue. And, and I think that's that's right. You know, it's um, you can change somebody's job title overnight, but to actually have yeah. people behave differently takes time and, and, and effort. Uh, SE, what do you think are some of the lessons you're learning as you try to implement these cyber secu security programs? So, so let me build a bit on the, the culture discussion. Okay. You know, we've raised a force that was very focused on security controls. Right. And security requirements. And I think somebody mentioned earlier we need to raise that force to be more risk aware and risk conscious and change the conversation, especially with our industry partners, about what we require, but focus more on the outcomes that we're looking to achieve and how we get there using the capabilities that Pete talked about earlier. Because it's more about an integrated defense versus buying tools and focused on techniques. Right. How do we put that integrated defense in place again, to harden the environment to protect us a bit more. So in that vein, we're having, I think, different conversations with our industry partners now. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about cloud adoption earlier. We've had several engagements with what we consider the big five industry providers on cloud technology. Something new for us. And I'll tell you, the first one was very painful because we talked to them from a requirements perspective. Right. This is what we want to do. And it took a several rounds of conversations to understand. We needed to open our aperture a bit right. and under clearly understand how industry is doing this and what of that we can adopt and maximize within the department. Right. So we, we've become very, or we are very prescriptive in how we do things. Mm -hmm. And to a dif degree, we have to be. But then how do we soften those edges a bit to allow innovation right. and take advantage of what our commercial partners are doing? Right. So you lay out, it's good to know you, the, the specifications, requirements, but then you define the result you're looking for exactly. and how do we you know, get to that result that we're, uh, we're trying to achieve. Um, excellent. Uh, Dominic, um, how about uh, lessons learned? What, what, uh, what are, as you work through these issues day after day, what are some of the things that uh, you encounter that are worth passing on? Well, I think everyone at this table would, and probably everyone who's listening to this show who's a cybersecurity professional, would agree that our world is an ever-changing world. You, there's no constants. You know, we, we uh, are constantly dealing with um, uh, evolving and changing threats, uh, evolving and changing technology uh, that we're trying to employ, we're trying to be innovative, uh, evolving and changing vulnerabilities that go along with that technology, and then while all that's going on, we have evolving and changing standards and statutory and regulatory requirements that we're trying to keep up with. So I often liken it to, you know, trying to uh, hit a moving target uh, that's moving very fast from the back of a pickup truck being driven at yeah. 60 miles an hour. You know, it's You're not, right. there's a lot to align to get all that Absolutely. to work. Absolutely. You know, the bad guys are looking at what the good guys are doing and trying to uh, anticipate how we get around this next, tool, this next defense. Absolutely. So, um, so if, uh, to, to Essay's point, um, if you look at this with a checklist mentality and just a list of requirements that you have to do, you're constantly going to be chasing, 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 and there's never going to be any way to keep up with it. So we really, uh, we've learned we really need to use more of a risk-based approach to prioritize and to really know where to focus our attention. Um, at, at VA, we're, we're building some new risk scoring methodologies that we can use to help us you know, pinpoint where we need to um, focus our efforts. And we're also uh, embarking on revising our enterprise uh, security architecture so that that architecture uh, is better informed by our risk scoring and our understanding of where the priorities are. Because uh, otherwise, we'll, we'll never catch up with the threat. Right. right. Yeah, it is, um, it is an interesting sort of like cat and mouse game, you know, trying to uh, stay ahead of the curve. Uh, Clark Campbell, how about... Um, 
from your perspective, what are some of the things you're learning along the way here? Some of the maybe surprises that pop up here or there or things that you, uh, you encounter that you pass on to your colleagues and other government folks? The government isn't demanding enough on what they ask from industry. I like that. As we approach the issues of LPTA, um, if you want to solve a problem, how do you quickly come in, solve it? It doesn't take two weeks, three weeks, five weeks, a month, whatever the case may be. And I realize I just screwed up five weeks in a month in succession. But it is, how do you come in and prove that out to us with minimal thing? How do you come in in a day and help us improve our risk management framework? There should be a way to prove that out with limited effort mm -hmm. to be able to show value. Right. And how does that impact the RMF and the day-to-day -day operations? And that is what the government should be asking for. And the government is too used to industry saying, we need extra time and we need a lot of your people. Mm. So put more pressure on. Yes, sir. Yeah, I like that. Um, you know, it's in its... <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, sometimes, too, it's a little frustrating because some government people I talk to, uh, chief information security officers, they're so overwhelmed with so many things they're trying to get their hands around. And in, in, in a lot of cases, they lack bench strength. You know, there's not a lot of depth, you know, once you get below the top guys and having enough. So a way to address that is let's, let's lay it on industry and get them in here. Every vendor wants to do a pilot. Every vendor wants to try to help you out. Right. Have qualifications for that. Well, I like that, and I think, you know, back to what we were talking about with SE, if you demand, demand a result you want to achieve, you know, and say, achieve this result, and then we'll, t and then we'll talk. Uh, Tony Hubbard, what do you think uh, in terms of lessons you're learning along the way? Well, I'm going to follow on the theme that Pete and Essie talked about in terms of, 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 of culture, specifically around the concept of accountability. Okay. Uh, for instance, KPMG did a, a survey last year with ISC Squared, a mm -hmm. federal senior uh, cybersecurity executives. And one of the key points that came out, one of the overwhelming key points that came out of that is there's a sense of a lack of accountability at the highest level of the organization, meaning that if somebody were to be polled, okay, who's responsible for cybersecurity in my organization, they're going to point to the CISO or the CIO. And the reality is, and I think hopefully the executive order will, will, will change some of this culture, is it's got to start at the top of the right. department, top of the agency. And I think that's, that's one of the themes. And I think the second theme around culture and accountability is having more focused energy at the at the line level in terms of understanding what cyber risks are and I'm going to give Pete and his team a call out here because they have a program called CyberWorks in the Air Force where they're f specifically focusing on sprints around one week intervals where they bring in groups to talk about specific cyber challenges and come out of that coming out with it with an outcome and a solution and I think that's a great way to kind of change the culture a little bit in terms of getting everybody on board across the organization yeah. around cyber yeah excellent point now accountability you know it's a good one I mean even in total government now I think the executive order is trying to address the accountability issue but in the past I mean we had NSA we had DOD we had cyber command we had you know and in my mind when I was a CIO at Treasury I will always say to my think to myself well, when something bad happens, who's going to be the one that has to go up there and testify yeah. in Congress? You know, I mean, and the bottom line is, we, it's not clear. It's right. very, very fuzzy as to who's in charge and a, a what, and a lot of issues around cybersecurity. Um, Tony Cole, what do you think in terms of uh, lessons learned along the way? Things that um, you encounter that you think are worthy of passing on to the listening audience? Well, I think one thing that really comes to me is, you know, and if you listen to all the comments from everyone here on the panel, you know, the fact that uh, the challenge continues to evolve. As you stated earlier, Jim, the bad guys are always watching, and it's important to note the bad guys are watching the other bad guys. Nation right. states are watching organized crime and vice versa. So we have to actually uh, think about that mindset, and there is no more, this is the architecture I'm going to put in place, and it's going to last for five years. We're going to continue to evolve at a very quick pace across the board, you know, and you're going to need to, as Pete said, put those new tools in place as quickly as possible in pilots, much like financial services is doing. Here's my operational team that actually runs everything for cybersecurity, but here's my two to five year outlook team that's actually looking at new technologies, right. looking at evolving threats to actually get ahead of that. I think the 
cloud piece is going to help. And as Essay talked about new requirements, I think that can help industry a lot by making those cloud requirements and other requirements very clear and, where possible, consistent across the entire federal government. And that's going to give them more solutions to choose from. We recently put our email threat prevention through FedRAMP ourselves, mm -hmm. trying to actually meet the requirement. But again, you know, it doesn't meet all of the requirements for government because there aren't consistent requirements yet. Right. So I think any place they can do that is going to be very, very helpful. And I think that's something else that's evolving that they understand that and are trying to move in that direction. Exactly. And I think, you know, the, the sophistication of the threats and the, uh, are getting much, much more advanced and much more complex. It's, it's no longer just your long lost Nigerian uncle from uh, somewhere who wants to send you a billion dollars that, uh, and I'm not sure how that's working. I mean, I've been sending my thousand dollars to him for a couple of years now, and I haven't got any money back yet. So I'm not. Uh, but uh, uh, Tony, you have a follow-up on that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really interesting. You know, threats are getting more sophisticated, but they're only getting to the level of complexity needed to accomplish their goal. And I think that's very that's important a very for us. Good point. Yeah, we really have to think about that. You know, and it's not mentioned very much. It's in our M Trends report. We talk about this. So if we don't focus on patching, they're going to compromise those systems. But if we patch those systems, they're going to go after the more critical assets in a complex fashion. Right. So we have to actually build our defenses around that that thinking. That's right. And, and you got to think the breadth of the issues because if you focus on something too narrow, they'll go for the easiest way to penetrate penetrate the network. Um, you know, and. Uh, <clears throat> And that's what we've seen happening, you know, go with the easiest exploitation. Um, I, I used to tell the Secretary of Treasury, you know, that back in the early days, a couple times, websites were hacked and, and whatever. And I would say it's really not that big a deal. There's no data in that website. It's just a, an open door. It's a little bit of embarrassment, but we can fix it in a matter of minutes. We can't spend all our money dealing with that. We, we've got real data we need to protect. That's where we really need to spend our, our dollars. Uh, we're going to talk about the hard stuff now, the things that are difficult to do, the challenges, constraints. And, um, and if you think in your mind a program that you can use to, you know, maybe uh, demonstrate some of the challenges you have, that would be good too. Let's, um, let's start with SE again. Um, SE, in terms of, you know, the hard things, the things that, are, you know, you really got to find a way to get done in order to be where you want. And if, um, and if a program comes to mind that you're trying to work, um, that would be good too. Well, I'll tell you, the one that immediately comes to mind is what we're doing with the defense health uh, arena. Mm -hmm. As you know, we're moving a fair amount of our uh, health data right. to a commercial that. environment. You know, so we come into this with a very risk management framework focus and understanding, again, what our security controls are. The challenge there was now understanding how industry does business, knowing that they approach security potentially from a different aspect, mm -hmm. not as strongly or as rigid in some instances as the department, mm -hmm. which drove us to figure out how do we need to strike a balance? Because right. how do you balance cost and security? and still get the effectiveness and the outcomes that, that you're is, looking for. Yeah. That is, that is, where does that line go? Exactly. I mean, you know, you get all the, here's all the things we want to do, here's the amount of money we have, where are we going to draw that line? Tough issue. And where are those things that are, are not as important to me, mm -hmm. the way I can be a bit more flexible in how we protect the data because right. it's not valuable right. or may, not, may be uh, even spongible, I'm okay with that. Right. Um, but how do I, no kidding, protect the jewels right. as I move more information into the commercial environment? Yeah. And I guess that's a risk assessment to try to define what is our most uh, precious jewels and where is our, where are our biggest vulnerabilities and so forth. And I think as we look to expand our boundaries more in that way, it will challenge that for us, challenge our thinking. Right. Peter, what do you think? Uh, the tough things to do, the real hard things you got to... Well, I will tell you, it's, it's the po in the policy arena and balancing that, like what, what Essie was talking about, with the operational commander. So... Um, we, we, we have hundreds of policies in the Air Force. The Secretary has launched a new initiative with the Chief of Staff to start literally deleting Air Force instructions right. and regulations where we don't need them. At the squadron level for security, there are probably hundreds of uh, instructions, DOD memorandums, Air Force instructions, guidance memos, DISAS, security implementation guides, cybercom X words, task words. Uh, and other policy memorandums of the department, and it all goes down to those few airmen at the squadron level going, I can't possibly do all this and also conduct mission right. and operations. So uh, we're taking an active look to see where policy makes sense 
uh, and deleting those that, quite frankly, aren't needed anymore so that we can enable the airmen to think about how to do security and not have a risk control checklist uh, mindset, but more of a thinking person that is risk aware, as, as he was saying, risk conscious. Mm -hmm. And so conducting the operations at the edge uh, instead of trying to figure out what every control needs to be done on top of all the other things that need to do. Yeah, excellent points, excellent points. Yeah, because uh, oftentimes something goes wrong and you probably create another policy and then something happens, create another policy. Before you know it, you've got um, so many policies that you're, you're totally confused. I think we're, yeah, at the lowest level, they are, we've confused that guy at the, at the person <laughs> at the lowest level. They are literally, they have stacks of policies they, they're trying to follow. We're trying to get it down to a manageable right. number. You know, I used to tell when I was doing consulting, I used to tell companies the same thing that, you know, you can't just sell another tool. What you need to do is come up with, if you have a tool, you need to talk about this tool can be, be go in and we can do away with these other five tools you don't need anymore. That's the way you have to approach it. You can't just keep buying another tool. You have to find ways to simplify. Same thing you're talking about with Tell the policies. Point, the, the Outlook team is a great idea because we have the operational team trying to do day-to-day -day operations but test out the new joint regional security stacks and also adopt mm -hmm. new tools and look on the horizon for right. newer things and it's not it's not as efficient as it could be, so mm. you need to figure out ways to make that better. Sure. For the operator. So, uh, if I may, I think that sure. goes back to that integrated defense I talked about earlier. You know, as we do a full architecture review, where are those gaps? Right. And that's where we need to focus on how do we fill the gaps versus buying things or tools that we mm. already have. Right. What's the capability that we're missing, and how do we close that hole? Excellent. Excellent. Uh, Dominic uh, Cousat, what uh, tough things to do, challenges? Well, with, with an enterprise as large as ours that's so geographically dispersed across the United States and the world, um, you know, one of our biggest problems is uh, understanding what's going on on our networks and who's on our networks. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's one thing to put all the policies in place and meet all the requirements and set your baseline and, you know, um, uh, start operating, but uh, then there's continuous monitoring and you have to know what's going on out there, know what's not going so well, where the new vulnerabilities are. So we're doing a lot at VA to uh, uh, implement our continuous diagnostics and mitigations program. We're working very closely with DHS to get those tools out there that allow our operators that inside knowledge of what's going on real time on the networks that they can share with uh, management and, and with the field. Um, in terms of who's on the network, it's just as important to know who's on your networks. Um, so VA's come a long way in terms of um, implementing two-factor authentication. We're getting away from uh, username and password when um, as recently as a year and a half or two years ago, VA was at uh, in single-digit percentages for implementing two-factor authentication using right. a, a, a PIV card to access your network right. and not using username and password. We're now at 93 percent and that's that's no easy lift um, for, a, for an entity like us or like DOD. Right. We've got a lot of people in very austere environments environments, working in operating rooms or um, uh, in a tactical environment, they don't have time to pull out right. a, a PIV card and log in. So getting there was a challenge, I but we, we got there and it's really been helping. Well, terrific, terrific. I want to hear from industry on this too, and we'll lead off with you, Tony, uh, when we come back. But we first need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM. I'm Jim Flyzik here with S.E. Miller from Department of Defense, Peter Kim from the Air Force, Dominic Cusack from Veterans Affairs, Tony Cole from FireEye, Tony Hubbard from KPMG, and Clark Campbell from BDNA. We're talking cybersecurity. We've been talking through progress and priorities. And we end up with talking about, uh, with our government guests, about some of the really hard stuff, the tough challenges that have to be overcome in order to get to where we want to be. Tony uh, from FireEye. Tony Cole, what, uh, what do you see as some of the big, biggest challenges, the hard things to do? I think, you know, we touched a lot on the security controls that, that many people are working on. And if you look, you know, NIST is, is releasing the, the new uh, 
revision 5 of 800-53. And I think one of the things that can be very beneficial to anyone trying to actually secure a department is to actually step back, you know, and look at those security controls with the aspect of, you know, what is going on in the physical realm where we've been very successful around physical security and apply that to the cyber realm. And that's not often done and should be done. And if you think how institutionalized it is today where, you know, no one opens a door when it says alarm will sound. They right. just know better. Yeah. So we need to do the same thing in the cybersecurity realm. You know, we have two members of the Department of Defense here. You know, uh, any military unit's not going to try to take a hill without utilizing all the intelligence they have. Who is actually out there? What are they after? Why are they there? You know, we need to do the same thing in cybersecurity. What assets are you trying to protect? Who is after them? Why are they after them? So, and put our security controls in place around that. Excellent. And I think that's some of the lessons learned that people are starting to think about Excellent. today. Excellent. Understand uh, the field, the battlefield. Uh, Clark Campbell. Uh, BDNA, what uh, what are some of the tough things, the real hard things that need to get done to be where we want to be, other than give you guys a little bit more pressure to get things done? Policies don't matter. I'm old enough to admit in public radio that uh, clear cone didn't matter. Uh, FISMA didn't really have a whole lot of impact. CDM was supposed to solve world hunger. It didn't. Um, FATARAS gives us a checklist, but again, it's a guideline. Um, some, how about something as simple as what the Department of Homeland Security does? I'm not going to buy a product, a software product of a, from a vendor of a version that has end of life less than 12 months from now. So I'm not buying old stuff now. Mm -hmm. it is, it's not policy. Po policy is, is, is a report card and I went to a state school so they don't matter. Right. So it is how do you enforce things internally to be able to drive what is necessary for cybersecurity. And then it is the adult supervision. There is no technology company, whether it be FireEye, BDNA, or the adult supervision, the KPMGs apply, uh, that can do that. It is the government that needs to enforce that. Yeah, excellent point. And uh, we don't have time today, but I could tell you about the number of time I testified on FISM and things like that, made points very similar to what you did, that FISMA scores aren't solving problems. Uh, Tony Hubbard, what do you, uh, when you think of the tough things, the challenges, the things that are really difficult to do that you want to get done? Well, two jump out, more tactical challenges. Okay. One, we've already talked a little bit about third party providers and FedRAMP and things like that. Essie talked a little bit about that. And I think that that's critical and because if you, you just go take the example of Target, I mean, that was a third party breach. And, and there's so many examples of right. third parties where our, our federal agencies are connected to where you don't necessarily have that assurance that you would with your internal environment. And, and so I think you look at some of the standards out there, NIST 800-171 is out there going uh, from a compliance perspective by the end of this year, this calendar year. Hopefully that will drive more compliance. FedRAMP we've talked about. The American Institute of Certified Public Accounts, AICPA, has a standard coming around out around cyber attestation, mm -hmm. similar to financial services around SOC 1 reports and things. So I think that could help. So all of that kind of framework, I think, could help provide more assurance around the third party providers. And then the second one is around industrial control systems. Okay. Uh, certainly our DOD colleagues and, yeah, the, and the VA colleagues, that's a huge challenge and issue. We have so many with the rise of the internet capabilities and technology capabilities. You have so many devices that aren't just, are not prepared to right. to be connected, but right. yet there's so many vulnerabilities yeah, there. We started an Internet of Things show, and we're uh, getting coming up to our second version pretty soon to address yeah. just those kinds of things. Yeah. All right, well, we've got about 13 minutes left, and like what we like to do on all shows is when we have this kind of knowledge in the room is get your sort of vision for the future. Where is this all going? Are we going to get to a place where we're proactive and we can prevent most big attacks? Um, you know, you have uh, people, people talk about digital Pearl Harbors. You have people talking about, no, it's not that big a deal. Can can we get out in front of these things and be proactive and, and prevent most of the attacks that really cause damage? And let's work our way down the table. Tony, what's what's crystal ball look like for you? So I think one of the things that we have to realize, you know, and I, I mentioned it earlier and a number of people have discussed it as well in this panel, is the threat is going to continue to evolve. 
So we need to build a structure that allows us to evolve just as quickly. So for instance, if we have a 10 foot wall, we're trying to keep the adversary out and they put up an 11 foot ladder, then we need to be instrumented where we can actually knock that ladder down very quickly. They're not able to steal anything. We can close the hole and move on to the next, to the next time. Because I think today we talk about cyber hygiene and some of the issues in that area. We need to fix it today right. because this problem is going to get infinitely worse. So the other Tony just mentioned uh, IoT. That's going to be a massive issue, and we've not even seen that start yet. I mean, right. it's in its infancy. When you tie that together with 5G that's being tested around the globe today, so and where you actually have a perimeter that completely goes away, and many of the devices you buy and implement will directly connect via 5G, you know, then you actually have an enormous problem if you don't start to solve some of those challenges today around putting policies in place that are understood and institutionalized across the board with your organization being aware of the challenges. Right. So you've got to implement some type of gamification around right. security awareness. No c complacency. you got to continually be trying to get ahead of that curve. Clark Campbell, what's the future look like you, for you, sir? As the non-Tony on the industry panel, okay. um, IoT is a great talking point, but right now the federal government cannot protect commodity IT. And if th there is no lack of data that already exists within the federal government to be able to understand that, so how do you turn it into actionable information? Most of the hacks, most of the issues, most of the problems are end of life, end of support, stuff that is old. The federal government is, no pun intended, the Smithsonian Institute of old stuff. They have everything in a spare. So what do you got? How do you prioritize the limited funding you have to protect it better? IoT is a problem for another appropriations bill. Hmm. Excellent. Excellent point. Uh, Dominic, um, what's your crystal ball look like? What's this going to look like down the road? Are we going to win this? Yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic. Um, you know, we, we're certainly going to try and keep up with it. Um, but, you know, we, we really do at VA want to move from a more reactive to a proactive posture. Um, we've done a lot uh, over the past year to work with our commercial partners um, to, to implement a, a lot of new scanning and sensing tools. We have a lot more data coming in about what's, what's on the network and, and what's happening on the network. And so that gives us some day-to-day -day intelligence. But to really get to that proactive piece where we're ahead of it, um, VA, at VA we're looking into um, or, or we're, we're uh, testing out uh, some, some predictive analytic capabilities. We're leveraging, in three different instances, we're leveraging some supercomputing capabilities from some of our commercial partners mm -hmm. to take all that data we're getting in from our sensors and scanners and, and couple that with um, intelligence that's just of what's going on on the World Wide Web, uh, new threats and vulnerabilities that are going on on out there to sort of correlate that and figure out, you know, hey, what could possibly be happening here? What's, what could happen in the next day or week? And how can we get ahead of it and, and, and make sure we have the things in place to counter it if it happens? So I think um, leveraging automation and, and innovative tools like that uh, on top of all of the hygiene we've put in place and all right. the scanning and sensing could really help us get there. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, you know, tools and artificial intelligence could play here and pr predictive tools and analytics and things like that that um, uh, look for anomalies and in, in, are able to detect these things before they happen. Uh, Tony Hubbard, KPMG, what's it look like to you down the road, Tony? Well, I want to follow on to a point Dominic made, I okay. think, around the concept of automation, because I think from a vision perspective, that, that is going to be critical when you look at, not necessarily, when you look at it from the from commercial industry, there's a lot of automation techniques around the concept to do things cheaper. But in the federal government, it's different. You, want to, you, want to necess, you don't want to necessarily do it cheaper. You want to take your best and brightest folks and put them on, more the, on the more challenging tasks and automate some of the less or the manual oriented tasks, you know, system access reviews, uh, audit log reviews, that type of thing, uh, you know, automating uh, the risk management framework elements, things like that, the, the, the more manual processes. And if we can get automation more focused on that, I think that will tremendously free up more of the, re the limited resources that the government has. Excellent, excellent point. Uh, Peter Kim, what's it look like down the road to you at uh, in your Air Force role? Not becoming the Smithsonian of old stuff. <laughs> um, and really, and I, I mean that seriously. Uh, Essie and I were talking in the car 
I, I want young people to come into the Department of Defense and the Air Force and be jazzed and energized about new technologies and innovation. Mm -hmm. I don't want these 19-year-old kids showing up and I have to slap, you know, a thousand pages of controls and instructions they've got to read and say, that's what you've got to follow. Right. I, wanted, I want them to be able to uh, get into a new world where we're not the Smithsonian and we're this, this other entity for mm -hmm. cybersecurity and cyber operations. That's that's where I'd like to really focus on, on on changing the mindset of, no, we're not old school, we're totally new school, we're IoT, we're handheld mobile devices, we're social media, we're also state-of-the-art right. security, bringing in new technologies and new thinking into a really complex problem. You know, I think that's a really, really good point and a really important point. I think, you know, uh, the next generation is, is going to be so computer literate that when they come in, they're not going to want to do Absolutely. things the way they were always done. And we want them to be creative and innovative and encourage them to come up with new ideas. I think people leaving because we don't, we're not doing that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just had a captain leave. He's the CISO for Pokemon Go in Seattle. Yeah. Oh, wow. J.V. Yeah. Visnesky, that's a call to him. He, he left the Air Force because we're too old school for him. Wow. Interesting, interesting point that uh, dovetails off what Clark said. Uh, Essie, what's, uh, what's your crystal ball look like? Where's this all going? What's it going to be like down the road? Our ultimate responsibility is to protect the Department of Defense Information Network such that it enables our warfighting missions. Mm -hmm. And there are things that we have to do to make sure we can get there. You know, first looking at speed to capacity. You know, how do we posture ourselves to meet the requirements of the warfighters much quicker mm -hmm. than we are doing today? Which means agility on our part. How are we responsive to a threat dynamic environment? Now, how do we balance cost with security? And we understand what that trade-off is, back to understanding what's important to us, and then leveraging our partnerships with industry so that we understand the emerging technologies, we understand how we can use those to fill our gap, such that we are predictive in understanding the threats and being responsive to them before they hit, and taking some of the responsibility off the humans because they really are our most vulnerable character in this picture. Mm -hmm. you know, if that end user is not as aware as we would like them to be, how do we take on that responsibility right. such that the system takes care of it before it hits them? And then to Pete's point, where's our trained and ready force? Right. You know, posturing ourselves right to bring in the next generation of the folks sitting around this table. You know, that speed issue is one that I'm glad you brought up because, uh, you know, I've talked on the show before about we're get approaching, in, especially in things like cybersecurity, a world where decision-making time is approaching zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, things happen so fast, you know, and, 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 and things can happen in cyber attacks so fast that um, you need to begin thinking in terms of uh, you know, time approaching zero in terms exactly. of how fast decisions can be made to uh, offset problems. All right, as I try to do with each show, I try to do some recap of uh, some of the little nuggets I heard from all of you that um, resonated with me. Uh, when we talk progress, <clears throat> first thing we, we heard about was awareness and the fact that you need to create awareness throughout the entire organization that everybody's in this together. It's not the chief information security officer is not going to solve all the problems in the organization. It's going to take everybody's awareness to realize they have responsibilities too. Uh, we talked about progress in preparing to go to the cloud and what uh, some of the issues that brings up around security. We talked about how risk management is a good way to approach the subject as opposed to cybersecurity or bits and bytes. And when you're talking to senior leadership, you talk about business risk, you talk about trusted organization, trusted agency. If you're seen as having good security, Security, I think you'll be seen as being a very good organization. Um, and we talked about the, the need to be proactive, more proactive in the future. Priorities, we uh, talked about the fact that there is an executive order out there that gives some direction to that. We talked about uh, mission and weapon systems in, in the DOD being top priority. We talked about better detection tools. Uh, we talked about going back to the fundamentals and talking about the blocking and tackling and the basic things that we're not doing. And we talked about the developing common operational pictures. Lessons, culture, and people came up as it uh, usually does on our show uh, that, that uh, you, know, you need to deal with the culture, people, processes, uh, risk consciousness across the organization, 
um, demand more. We heard demand more from uh, uh, from uh, Clark, um, and we heard accountability. The need to you know really have people accountable for things. As so, if no one's accountable, then when things go wrong, everybody's going to point the finger at everybody else. And uh, so that issue, <coughs> I think, came out loud and strong. Uh, challenges. We heard about some of the challenges with the, the, the defense health commercial environment and the fact that it's, uh, it's just a, a big, big challenge. Uh, policies. We talked about policies. Perhaps there's too many. Um, perhaps we need to decide you know, what we need. We heard about identifying gaps being a challenge. We heard about who's on the network being a challenge. Uh, Two-factor authentication. Don't buy old stuff industrial control systems. We heard about the, all of those being challenges that are, that are on the table. Um, when we got into talking about uh, vision, uh, we talked about the need for continuous improvement processes or ways to stay ahead. And uh, you know, if the ladder is 11 foot and they you know, go over that ladder, we need to find a way to have a, have a bigger ladder or whatever. Uh, you had some good analogies there we talked about. We talked about prioritization and the fact that uh, we need to um, prioritize what we're going to do. We have a finite budget and we have certain things. You need to really identify what are our biggest vulnerabilities? What are the biggest areas that we really need to focus our, our money and time and resources on because we don't have unlimited resources? In vision, we talked about proactive, and I liked what Peter was saying about the fact that we need to have younger generations coming in. We need ways to incentivize them to be creative and innovative and not just do things the way things have always been done. We talked to speed to capacity and the fact that the decision making has to be done much quicker than it was in the past. And we talked about, uh, in my mind, at the things I heard and what I took away from this is everything you're talking about here is about saving lives, making our country more secure in the future, and uh, making the country more secure for fu future generations and our kids and grandkids and those that come behind us. With that, I want to thank our panelists for being here, taking time from your busy days to share your knowledge. I want to thank our sponsors, without which we have no show. Uh, the good friends here at Federal News Radio that always do such a great job hosting us. My good partner, Tom Trezza, who uh, helps handle logistics and all the things that go on in the background. And of course, most importantly, I want to thank our listening audience that tune in and listen to the show each month. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.